This is the second PowerPoint presentation on the Thessalonian Epistles. I hope you were able to solve the puzzle of the comings and goings between Paul and Macedonia just before he wrote the two letters, or at least that you were able to understand from the answer sheet how the pieces probably fit together. I'll do some more on the specific situation that led Paul to write this letter. But before I do that, uh, I have one slide with a few general points of historical background related to the city of Thessalonica uh, that I'll deal with first. Oh, <clears throat> the city still exists today. It's the second largest city of Greece. Uh, it's only its name that has shortened a bit with time, uh, but it's still there uh, as a significant center uh, of uh, commerce. Uh, in Paul's days, it also was uh, a large, influential city. The Romans had made it the capital of Macedonia, and it was located at the Via Ignatia, the Ignatian Way, that connected the east of the Roman Empire with the west, or with its center. Uh, the road uh, started at the Bosporus, and so connected the west with all of Asia Minor. Uh, it cut through Macedonia and um, ended at the west coast uh, of Greece, just opposite of uh, Italy and uh, Rome. Um, it, and so it enabled relatively fast and safe uh, traveling in those days. Uh, no doubt uh, this is the road that Paul and his companions took uh, coming from uh, Philippi. Uh, and traveling uh, to Thessalonica and beyond. Now, it's, if you haven't done so already, it's uh, worthwhile to have a look at the two web links in the lecture plan. Um, they lead you to a map of the road and to some pictures uh, of what uh, remnants of the road look like today. Uh, it's an interesting thing to look at. So now let's move on to the specific setting of the book. What was going on that led Paul to write? And how can we find out? How do we find the reason why someone wrote something? Well, here's a simple way. Observe what is written in the document and ask why. Why is this in the text? Now, that's oversimplifying things. Doesn't always quite work. You know, just because subject A is in a letter doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem with subject A. There may be another reason for it. It still requires careful judgment. Uh, but still, it's a place to start. And so we'll do this for the Thessalonian letters. What are the issues? What's in the book? Well, these are the main topics that are covered. There's the conduct of Paul and his team, sexual conduct, brotherly love. There's the work ethic, especially in 2 Thessalonians, a little bit in the first one as well. <coughs> then there's uh, the question of those who are asleep and the time of Christ's coming. And in the second letter, the day of the Lord, <coughs> has it already begun? So what are the problems that are reflected in these topics? Well, there certainly are questions related to the second coming. Uh, what about those who have died? And has the day already come? This is why Paul explains so much about this subject. Um, and it appears that the problems and misunderstandings have become worse in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 2, in the second letter, indicates that there may be a false letter or a prophecy that people claim comes from Paul, which is contributing to the confusion. Or, or maybe it's just a rumor that there is such a thing. Uh, but all of this together certainly is a reason for Paul um, to get to writing. 
a brotherly love and sexual conduct. That's a different thing. Here we cannot simply ask why and turn the topic into a problem. Sexual immorality was so widespread and accepted in the ancient world that it would have to be addressed anywhere. Nothing in these letters indicates that it was particularly bad or problematic in this church situation. Well, regarding love, Paul actually praises the church. What he does do is urge them to work. Uh, <coughs> in First Thessalonians, and, and so already in, in, in the first letter you may have picked up that there's a, a problem or a need to bring some, some correction or at least some instruction. Uh, and he's even more emphatic on this in the second letter. So there's a problem here uh, that Paul's picking up and uh, that fits well with the first century context. Menial or, or physical work was actually looked down upon. Uh, was seen as uh, unfit for um, uh, higher class people. It's often thought that this uh, problem with work is related to the second coming. Sort of uh, people stopped working because they were waiting for it to happen any moment now. <coughs> but the fact is, even though this is uh, often claimed, Paul does not make the connection. He makes no direct link between the second coming and the fact that some people are not working productively. Uh, and so I think it's questionable that there is such a link. Uh, there's enough in the first century context that would explain that there's people who are trying to uh, make an easy living uh, without working. Um, uh, it doesn't need a theological explanation, I think. Now, what about Paul and his team? That's the one we still got left. Paul sure writes a lot about their behavior. Many things think that this is because there are doubts about Paul or even accusation against him because of his quick departure, the fact that he did not return. Uh, maybe people are claiming Paul's been taking advantage of the church. Now, I used to think this, uh, but I think differently now. Uh, fact is, there are no explicit indications for any accusations. There's no reference to any accusers or opponents. Uh, this is very different from Second Corinthians, which is indeed a defense and where Paul says some of the same things about his behavior. But there it's clear that there are opponents, that there are accusers. Here, I think there's an alternative explanation. Paul is setting himself up as an example to imitate. His real aim, and this is quite explicit in the letter, is to promote perseverance, love, holiness, not to defend. Paul and his companions are an example of steadfastness in the face of opposition and of love and care and of working for their own needs. And Paul wants the Thessalonians to do the same thing. Fact is also, example and imitation are key terms in these letters. In uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul worked to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. And so, different from any accusations, all of this is quite explicit in both letters. This is a good example of um, a letter where it's not so easy to decide what exactly is the reason for writing. Is it a personal defense occasioned by accusations? Or is Paul setting himself up as an example for the Thessalonians to emulate? I think the letter, but there is room for discussion. So mm, let's not be too definite or too confident in our conclusions. Uh, in a moment, uh, I will come back to the uh, key terms that I pointed out in the first PowerPoint. Uh, I think this will offer some confirmation of my conclusion. 
Or at least that's what I think. Maybe you will come to a different conclusion. But first, before we get to those key terms, let me summarize the results. What, so what are Paul's reasons for writing? Well, for the first letter, uh, believers in Thessalonica face a tough challenge. Paul wants to encourage them to persevere and grow. Uh, he's actually been quite worried about how this is going. And then uh, there are some questions regarding the second coming uh, for which he provides clarification. Now, uh, this uh, first reason for writing here, it's still there in the second letter, but it, it's less dominant, uh, it's less important. Something else takes uh, first place here. The reason for writing Second Thessalonians, there's this um, sense of alarm, this anguish, commotion uh, about the day of the Lord. Has it already begun? Uh, there may well be a false letter or a prophecy or a rumor thereof uh, coming from Paul, supposedly, uh, that claims that this is the case. And then uh, as a secondary issue, although that probably isn't the direct reason why Paul sat down to write this, but it certainly is an issue he addresses, uh, is, is, is work. Uh, some people are avoiding it. Uh, and Paul argues that it's actually an honorable thing to do your work and earn your own living. But I think it's obvious in Second Thessalonians that the uh, commotion in the church because of end time mania uh, is the immediate occasion uh, for writing, is, is the reason Paul felt he had to uh, Add a second, write a second letter so shortly after the first one. So now we come to um, the core or key terms that we already looked at somewhat um, in the first PowerPoint. As we noticed in the first uh, PowerPoint, uh, there's this um, triangle, these three terms. <clears throat> that Paul uses to, uh, uh, to to sum up the whole idea of the Christian life. Faith, love, and hope. Now, faith and love are linked with work and labor. Right at the beginning of, the, of um, First Thessalonians, your work of faith and your labor of love. This is an important uh, work group uh, which uh, appears more than 15 times. Then hope is linked with the idea of steadfastness. Steadfast, stand firm, establish. A term that um, uh, appears more than 10 times or um, uh, a word group that uh, appears made on more than 10 times. And the need for it has to do with the third word group. Different terms related to affliction, persecution, suffering, more than 15 times. And surely this is the real reason Paul is worried. It's not accusations or slander about his own person, but that their present hardships may have moved them away from the faith. It makes the previous word group, stand firm, establish, be steadfast, so central to Paul's aims in writing. In the second letter it has become a bit less of a worry, although it's still an aim, judging by Paul's thanksgiving and implied praise for the church. This is 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3 and 4. We ought always to give thanks to, you, to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. 
Now, there's yet another significant word group. Holiness and sanctification. The idea appears more than ten times in the two letters. In other words, work, steadfastness, sanctification are the desired outcome or the expression of faith, hope and love. And they are threatened, or at least Paul had feared as much um, before he heard back from Timothy. They are threatened by persecution and affliction. Now, there's one more significant idea to add, and that's example or imitator. In all of this, it seems to me Paul is not defending himself, but rather setting himself up as an example. Uh, and in fact, in chapter 1, the Thessalonians themselves are marked out as examples as well, noted in all of Macedonia and Greece, so they sort of become an example to themselves. So, the Thessalonians themselves are an example, uh, and then Paul and his companions are an example in hard work, giving, not taking, in steadfastness, facing suffering, in purity and integrity, in affection, in love and care, fatherly love, motherly love, um, an example to imitate. It becomes clear what Paul's aim is then. Next to some correction on the theology or teaching of the Second Coming, it is for the Church to grow in love and holiness and to be steadfast. It is pretty much exactly what is expressed in the benedictions we looked at earlier in the first PowerPoint. This is what it means to live in the Gospel and live in the expectation of waiting for the Second Coming. And this is why Paul writes so much about his own behavior while in Thessalonica uh, in chapter 2 of the first letter. Now, at this point, I'm going to ask you to uh, pause the PowerPoint for a moment to reflect on this slide and a few questions. Did you observe any other key t terms not included here? How do they fit in? Based on your own observations, how would you define the main idea of the book? And as a point of application, if growth is the program, where do you need to grow? So let me repeat the questions uh, and then please uh, pause for uh, a few minutes to uh, reflect on this slide and the questions. The questions are, any other key terms you observe that are not included in this? How do they fit in? How would you define the main idea of the book? And where do you need to grow? This is uh, my attempt to define or formulate the main idea of the book. Steadfastness, sanctification, and active love are the way to live the gospel. In a sense, that's the program. This is the lifestyle that matches the hope or expectation of the second coming. Let me close with something that stood out to me in all of this. Now, here is Paul, a great mind, a powerful brain, a towering intellect, the greatest theologian of the Church. More than any other apostle, he translated Old Testament and Second Century, uh, Second, te sorry, um, Old Testament and Second Temple Judaism into a message of universal salvation in Christ. And yet he was also intensely relational, people focused. I love that combination of a great mind and intellect with a great heart. That's the example I take with me from. First Thessalonians in particular. This is the end of the second PowerPoint.